My name is Chris, and we are back with another episode, finally. Finally. Of, of A Brief History of Everything. Thomas is here, as always. Hello. And we're going to go in today to have a bit of a look at Watergate. Now, I don't know why Watergate it's just, yeah, seems It's just to, something random that popped into our minds, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it just seems to sort of appear you know, out, of, out of a shadow of nothing, really. Yeah, I mean, certainly there is a shadow hanging there, over us all. There is a shadow, definitely. Some would say the sort of Damocles, but we'll, we'll move on from that. So what we're dealing with today is we're going to do sort of two phases. It's a very narrative view of the events, so not really a lot of deep historical analysis, but a lot more instead by way of sort of just a bit more historical narrative. These are the events. Stop and talk about things as we get to them we find important. And then the second part of this, which is probably the more important part, is going to be an analysis of the importance of Watergate. And why do, for a start, why do we, like, gate everything <laughs> now? I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. It's the, if there's one worse part about Watergate, it's that everything became gate. Certainly not perjury or anything. Yeah, I, I, I would like the idea of, for example, if there's a scandal about pool fencing, I'd like it to be known as gate gate. Gate gate. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think the gate gate might be a bit interesting. It does also sound a bit like a toddler's pet name. So what's happening? Hey, hey gate gate, how you going? So... We're going to have a look at Watergate from its context because, as we've said a lot of a lot of the time on this podcast, it's important to discuss the context of a historical period. You can't just examine the issue in a vacuum because mm. the issue doesn't take place in a vacuum. So the 1960s in particular and, and even the end of the 50s when we deal with Nixon, uh, what sort of America are we dealing with? Uh, it's a turbulent America. It's America I don't think anyone would recognise compared to contemporary understandings of America. You've got the decade of assassinations, you've got um, JFK who's, who's assassinated his brother Robert, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, all of these significant figures both in political and social um, commentary life. These people are dying, it's causing great frustration, great um, sort of tensions in society and underlying all of that is participation in a war that is growing in unpopularity, not quite at the peak of unpopularity yet until we get to the period of Nixon, but certainly Vietnam, a very unpopular war. The society is starting to show the divisions and fractures that have been there but been papered over. And all of this has really come as a result of the changing relationship between citizen and state that's resulted from the end of World War Two and the emergence of the much more modern American global society. And Nixon has a large role to play in the way that this America would develop even before he's president. Um, as the vice president to yeah, as Eisenhower. the vice president to Eisenhower, um, Nixon's obviously highly involved there, and mm. it is expected to win the nineteen sixty election. Yeah, I think he's been um, given a narrative by the Republican National Committee, certainly by Eisenhower himself, even though Eisenhower and Nixon are not friends at all. They they quite openly are antagonistic of one another. Nixon has been fed this story that you will be the third term of Eisenhower, you will be the Republicans, you know, new generational shift and the new direction. Uh, and I think he largely buys into that because he goes into the uh, campaign against Kennedy expecting to win. And another area where I think we can sort of reinforce this idea of a different America is, of course, Nixon hailing from, of course... California. California, a very Republican at this point in time mm. state. I mean, right through Reagan, when we go through Reagan as well, same thing. California, very Republican. Now, when you go to a national election, it's so it's deep blue, blue. You, you, you'll never, you know, the idea of seeing it turn red seems to be almost impossible now. Oh, it's a farce. The only time it would happen is in a uh, scripted television show. Exactly. Maybe maybe about a, a wing of the White House, yes. um, potentially. And you would need Alan Alda you would to, need some to be Alan playing that. Yeah. And let's face it, that doesn't exist. No. <laughs> so, so with that in mind, so you've got a Nixon, Nixon, of course, coming from California. You've got Nixon being told he's the next... Next term of Eisenhower, Eric. Eisenhower, who is very popular. Mm. You know, Eisenhower's. It's it's interesting. We we've talked about the presidents. We talked about Eisenhower in particular, mm. and the fact that Eisenhower's term as president is very. It's quiet. It, yeah, it's it's. I mean, other than the Korean War, yeah. it is a largely uneventful 
But that's that's probably for a good thing yeah. because it shows Deft Hand. For a long time, um, historians have treated Eisenhower almost as like a, a sideshow and, and really given him a hard time mm. with their right. But more recently, there's been a real revision to his presidency and him as president. And he's we're starting to get the the transcripts and the official records that really reveal him as being a, actually a top notch president who knew what he was doing mm. despite what the media. Uh, later and then historians later bought into that he didn't know. And if you want a lot more detail about that, go back to our role of the President's podcast and have a, have a listen to our analysis of Eisenhower who comes out of that pretty well actually. Yeah. Um, and he's, he allows for the prosperity that goes into that start of the 60s. Yeah. And then said JFK comes along and the upstart John F. Kennedy you know, youngest president that we, we've yeah, seen there. Catholic then, as well. Catholic president beats Nixon. Yeah. Largely seen as being off the back of the televised debates. Yeah. You know, the first time we decided to do this big televised debate thing, Nixon famously is under the weather, rejects makeup, doesn't really want to do any of that, just goes on TV looking like Richard Nixon. Kennedy goes on TV, made up, presented beautifully, looking a um, million dollars. And they said the, the, the interesting study, which has been talked about many times, if you listen to the debate, you Nixon. tend to do a water to Nixon. If you watch the debate, you gave it to Kennedy. Yeah. So it's this impact of television that really stifles Nixon um, overall and maybe some crooked votes in Boston. <laughs> but mainly it's the impact of television. And it would shape Nixon's next act because Nixon, at this point in time, he's, he's dead politically. Yeah, he just retreats home he, yeah. he and he would he only ever once before becoming president runs for one other office mm. loses uh it's the governor of california mm-hmm. uh he runs for that loses and he's gives this great press conference saying well i'm done and you the media have no one you can't kick yeah. me anymore i'm uh, that's it yeah let's think about it before we get to watergate and nixon's presidency the, the two things we know about him is you won't have dick nixon to kick around anymore <laughs> And then he had a dog called Checkers. Um, <laughs> my kids love that dog. But <laughs> that's all we really know about Nixon, even as vice president. That's what we know. So one of the interesting things that has come out of the historical archive is that Nixon, while really resenting what happened with Kennedy, looked up to like what Kennedy had become as, this is what I need to be. And I mean, he, he sort of remoulds himself. He had always imagined that's what he would become. The, mm. the thing is that... He was promised as this generational shift, and Kennedy becomes the generational shift. He was promised as the younger, new face of a political party, and Kennedy becomes that. He was supposed to guide the prosperity. He was supposed to uh, guide America forward. Things like the moon landing, or the Apollo missions, or the space race, or even the arms race, or the foreign relations, which slightly improved towards the end of uh, Kennedy and into LBJ slightly with the Cold War. This should have been um, Nixon's legacy, and he, I think, he feels deprived and robbed of these things that Kennedy becomes. Yeah, and and I mean the interesting part is, of course, that it is Nixon who is there for the moon landing. It is Nixon who is there for a lot of the stuff that happens with yeah. race relations, but. He he gets no credit for it because it's a it's a Kennedy or it's an LBJ thing. Um, so Johnson then obviously takes over after the events of Dallas '63, and and you get Johnson now no Republican. If if Nixon had been thinking about a run there in '64, you don't really want to go against Johnson in '64 because no. he's continuing Kennedy's legacy. And let's face it, they put Barry Goldwater forward, and that's a disaster waiting to happen. Um, so Goldwater is soundly trounced by by LBJ, and that wing off the Republicans is is proven as being like uh, unelectable. Yep. Uh, even though Goldwater still carries a lot of weight during the Nixon years and is one of those power maker, power brokers that sits in the background, as you'll see when we get to the Nixon agreeing to eventually go. Barry Goldwater is one of the the leaders of the Republicans who goes to the White House and says to him, "You're done." So we get to a '68. Johnson comes out and says, you know, I will not seek nor will I accept another term as your president. So it, Sherman. so it blows the race open. Um, Hubert Humphrey, who has been largely 
neglected as the new vice president. Yeah. Um, you know, there was a great Tom Lehrer parody song in the 1960s, Whatever Became of Hubert, um, <laughs> where he, he, he says, you know, frequently the, the idea of every now and then you'll read something about him pinning a medal on someone or giving a speech or every now and then one of those where are they now columns, <laughs> whatever became of Deanna Durbin and Hubert Humphrey and those sorts of people. Um, in fact, the only place you see Hubert Humphrey is at Minnesota Vikings games <laughs> um, because from Minnesota he's a you know, proud Vikings fan and that's really his only exposure on the national stage. Nixon is able to take the Republican Party and what sort of remains after what's happened with Goldwater and starts to try to be this change that he's talked about. Yeah, I think he Nixon sees... He's obviously a genius at politics, Nixon. He's managed to survive and thrive even in the worst circumstances. And, and maybe he did intend to call it quits after he loses his governorship uh, run. But at the end of the day, he doesn't. And we can start to see he sees that there's storm clouds on the horizon for the Democrats. Robert Kennedy, who is seen as a presumptive heir for the Democrats in the same way Nixon was seen as a presumptive heir to Eisenhower, uh, Kennedy is assassinated. And so consequently, the the in, the favoured child of the Democrats is cut down during the primary season. Nixon, uh, while obviously having nothing to do with that and having made the decision to enter the race before that, um, well before, he, he ultimately comes to a forefront position as the person with experience, with a deft hand, with safety, with security, not representing an extremist wing of either party, which Humphrey's starting to be tarred with as the liberal, uh, very far left, unable to corral these anarchists and communists on the streets who are causing havoc at the DNC conventions. Nixon is seen as a much more calmer, safer choice, and he manages to run on that image. And it's a perfect, it is a perfect storm for Nixon. And one of the things that was said of Nixon, and again, another fascinating element of Nixon's character, is that up until Watergate, Nixon is regarded as a man who sees political turmoil coming from a long way off and deftly manoeuvres through it. And it's one of the skills that everyone with the Republican Party talks about when he gets the 68 nomination, is that Nixon can spot these things that no one else sees coming. And he's very politically astute. Now, that would abandon him by the time we get to the end of this period. But it's it's sort of this drive that he gets of, I really want power and I will do whatever I want, whatever I can to get this power. The other interesting part about it is that the, the Democratic side of things, Humphrey gets the nomination. Kennedy, even though he's assassinated, not likely to actually win the nomination overall. It's a very... He's, he's still a long way behind when he wins the California primary. And... Kennedy would have actually probably made that issue more murky for the Democrats. And I think even before the Kennedy assassination, I think that Nixon was in that box seat to win that election, no matter who the Democrats eventually put up, because there was so much turmoil. You mentioned it before. The Democratic convention that year is literally a bloodbath. Mm. And so it's Nixon who can say, I'm stability, I'm security, he goes back to his Eisenhower days of look at what we had. Wasn't American nice? Don't you remember when? But I'm also progressive and I'm also looking to the future. And you've also got Vietnam. Mm. And Vietnam is this thing just hanging over this 68 election. And it's just dangling there. And and Humphrey can't really address the six, uh, Vietnam from his perspective as well because he can't necessarily fire against Johnson yeah. that's dangerous to do within that party especially when you've got a battle for your primary mm. Nixon has this ability to make a move on Vietnam doesn't straight up make the call though uh, Nixon's quite sort of on the fence at first about it although as you'll see when we get into Nixon's term he's not very much on the fence he, he makes his play yeah, Nixon and the Republicans generally have the better uh, hand when it comes to Vietnam. The easy answer to it is, well, I would never have got us in there in the first place. Yep. That's that's the first answer. But now we're there, this is my idea. That, that plays right into the Republicans' platform, whereas the Democrats have to look back and go, well, why did Kennedy escalate? Why did Johnson escalate? The issues we have over the Gulf of Tonkin, the issues yep. we have over conduct, the issues we have over escalation, these are all democratic issues. Republicans quite e can quite easily say from the outside, never would have got us into the problem in the first place. And give me the office, I'll find a way out of it yep. without providing any details. No, exactly. You don't have to. You don't have to provide a way out. All you have to say is, I don't have the baggage 
that they have of being in there in the first place, I can get us out of there. So Nixon wins. It's a close election. It's a very tight election, but Nixon does beat Humphrey. And Nixon, eight years after he believes he should have been president, is president of the United States. So Nixon makes a few bold decisions um, during this, this this sort of era of his presidency. We'll, we'll focus on a few of the positives. Mm. Um PRC is the first one that I'm going to bring up. People's yep. Republic of China. Um, now, for those who aren't aware, uh, up until this point in time, Taiwan <laughs> is the Republic of China. Is the Republic of China, and 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 Red China is that giant thing. But it's not actually China. Where Taiwan is China because that's where Chiang Kai-shek's followers all went post post the, the revolution. Nixon looks at this and goes, "That's a bit dumb." I we- think he sees a, a, a potential Cuba at some point. Yeah, he he sees that. Um, there's this island which wants to be one thing and a larger power somewhere else wants it to be another. Yeah. And this has the potential to create tension with another larger power. He, I think he sees with quite good uh, sort of forward thinking that Russia may end up not being a problem at some point, that China will inevitably be something yep. on the world stage. It just cannot. And so the smoother the ride there is, the better it will be. You also get a bit more of a, a, a thawing of the, the Russian relationship too under, under under Nixon as well. There's a sort of era towards detente and the idea of, you know, let's, let's not escalate for the moment. Neither of us can really afford this. America's like, we're kind of up to our eyeballs in Vietnam and you really don't have the money to do this, so let's just back it all down for a moment. And if you think about that era, 68 to, to sort of 72, 73, 74, Russia's not as engaged as they had been previously. They're sort of, their wings have been clipped a little bit um, post post uh, what happens with Cuban Missile Crisis. Everything sort of scales a little bit for, for Russia. They're still, they're still heavily involved in sort of like helping with things like Vietnam, but mostly they're just letting America get themselves in trouble. We don't need to do anything. It's not going to cost us any money. Just let the Americans bumble around in the jungles of Vietnam. Yeah, certainly when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, it's it's skewed away from Russia yeah. primarily and moved towards uh, Asia. Two reasons why: um, both Johnson and Nixon saw that the Sino or the Chinese Russian connection was actually starting to break yep. that Mao and his um, administration were going a different route of communism and that fracturing was late, greatly exploited by Nixon who saw okay here's our chance to pull them away yes they may still remain communist but it's it's a workable version they're of they're our communists damn it they're our favourite communists the second thing is that a Russian foreign policy had really turned to both the satellite states and Asia you start to see them encroaching on the borders of places like Afghanistan f- uh, funding rebel groups in Iran Iraq which are going to become sticking points for America later on they're really helping to prop up North Korea they're really starting to pay attention to places of the world that America is neglecting because America is now focused in on Asia Africa Central Asia become opportunities for potential expansion of the Soviet Union and they really they really sort of also drive in hard on the European bloc they've already got yeah. because America cannot spread itself that thin. It can't be as engaged as it, it had been in, say, from 1945 up until the 1960s and the war. The war in Berlin is basically the period of time where America goes, we're out of Europe for a while, we're going over here. Yeah, so the, the wall is kind of the, the period of time where you can say there's, there's sort of a gentleman's agreement of we're out for a bit, we're going to focus over here, mm. the Russians can take this bit over here, we're going to keep a presence but we're not going to really up what we're doing in Europe at the time. The astounding thing is how much the Republican mindset changes from Nixon Ford to Reagan. Oh, it's huge. It's it's like, again, it should be similar to a generational shift of something hasn't worked for 100 years, we need to try something massively new. Reagan comes in with a completely different idea that we're not going to tolerate, we're going to escalate, we are going to restart the arms race and we're going to bankrupt you unless... You choose to back down, and they they don't choose to back down, and they ultimately it all falls apart. And Nixon's much more deaf, soft hand, I feel as though, was probably the better approach to it. But it was abandoned with Nixon when he was abandoned by the Republicans. And and again, those people who who understand Reagan's campaigning, Reagan campaigns in eighty on the back of one, 
we don't need another four years of Jimmy Carter. And secondly, and far more importantly, he goes back to the Republican Party of Ford and of Nixon and says, we need to move away from this Republican Party too. You know, again, infamously at the at the announcement of Ford for his term, the, he gives his rallying cry at the convention. Everyone turns around and goes, we picked the wrong candidate. Yeah. So Nixon is recognising PRC, which is a bold move for the United States to make, but again, a politically shrewd move. Um, lots of landmark decisions take place during this period as well. Things like Roe v. Wade happens. Now, again, he has no public statement on it. His private statements are a bit more contentious. Very contentious. Um, he, he does say that he believes that there are circumstances where abortion is acceptable. Um, some of those are in the example of rape, then there are some other not-so-pleasant examples in the relationship of race, but we won't go into that in any great depth. But the fact that you've got a, a two things here, number one, a Republican president acknowledging that there are situations where an abortion is acceptable yep. is an astounding idea. Definitely. I think the last, yep. the last Republican who campaigned with that was trounced by Barack Obama, and before that I have no idea no. Um, who would openly say these things. And the second thing is you've got a pre- political tool uh, off the Supreme Court, an objective third branch of government, which in a previous episode we spoke about the establishment of the three branches and how we probably don't see that there's three branches now. This is the defining point where the Supreme Court goes from being something off to the side that a 100 senators will just uh, yay vote a, a justice to now, OK, it matters who's on the Supreme Court. It becomes very politicised. And it really is Watergate that politicised it. So let's get into the, the crux of this matter. Now, we'll come back into Vietnam. And the reason we're coming back into Vietnam is that Vietnam kicks off all of this, and and there are some people listening going, but this is about the Democratic Convention and the Democratic National Headquarters and a break-in. It all begins with Vietnam. So Nixon gets what he refers to as his peace with honour, yes. um, which is which is America's way of saying we're, we're getting out of here, we've lost enough, we really can't keep doing this anymore. So peace with honour is what Nixon comes up with. They draw the line in Vietnam, uh, They they essentially negotiate the way out, the promises of X, Y, and Z uh, are made, and America starts to withdraw. What we find is that the leaking uh, that resulted in what is largely known as the Pentagon Papers, which really sh- reveals to people the true conduct and the true impact and the true consequence of this war, have really set off this great paranoia in Richard Nixon that um, everyone is out to get him or he can't necessarily trust everyone, and consequently these leaks need to be stopped. Now... This is one of the reasons why we did so much on that backstory of Nixon is because Nixon is a man who is desperate for power when he gets there. You know, he feels like he's been robbed of it once. So someone who's that desperate for power when they when they get there the first time, finally get there, is going to do whatever they can to keep hold of it. Now, the, the Pentagon Papers are the tipping point where Nixon starts to cross into this idea of whatever it takes. You know, to, to quote someone else from the 1960s, by any means necessary. Um, Nixon is going to hang on to this power. So the Pentagon Papers start leaking out this information. Nixon's response to the Pentagon Papers. Now, the other thing, just quickly on that, is when Nixon comes into office, he appoints the youngest White House team ever. All of his advisers are younger than any previous administration, including the Kennedy administration. He brings in people like Haldeman and Ehrlichman, who we'll talk about in a minute, as his chief advisers. They are his go-to men. He's, they're the people they're going to spend a lot of. He's going to spend a lot of time talking to. Um, so he brings in all these younger people. Now, one might suggest that a, a more experienced political hand may have helped Nixon negotiate these waters. A little bit more effectively, or at the very least, would have been prepared to when Nixon steps up and starts going, This is what I'm going to do. They would have had the guts to stand up to Richard Nixon and go, No, you won't. There's definitely a, um, an appeal to people who get fed up with the day to day of politics that inexperience is good, that not being a part of the system, not being uh, essentially a cog in the machine and just moving the cog to a new place that that can be a better thing. But I think whenever you find an administration that fills itself with inexperienced outsiders, it fails, and it fails pretty hard because they don't know the nuance or the subtleties or the way to do these things. So Nixon has all these young, inexperienced advisors surrounding him who think that 
mob mentality or street fighting or town hall or Tammany style politics is still in the vogue where that might work on a local level where you're trying to bust up, you know, a a congressional race, but it's not going to work at a federal level where every set of eyes is on you. Everything is scrutinized. There is a track record or a paper record or indeed a voice record of what has been going on and who has been making these decisions. And there's real consequences. Now, Nixon, Nixon, before we get, before he actually gets to the Pentagon Papers, he actually, in June of, uh, in, in July of 1970, he approves the idea of increasing the domestic intelligence gathering and then has a second thought about it and goes, no, I'm not going to give the CIA and the FBI those powers. So he scraps that. Then, in 1971, the Pentagon Papers come out in the New York Times. So it's the history of the Vietnam War, basically from within the Pentagon. This prompts by September, and the date given is usually September the 3rd, Mm -hmm. it prompts the development of the plumbers unit. So Nixon starts the plumbers. Now, the plumbers are a group of in-house people working for Nixon, mostly ex-CIA or ex-FBI, who are part of the administration or part of this group that's referred to... um, they're, they're, well, they're referred to by the acronym of CREEP, which I absolutely adore, so which, is the, which, which is all the committee to re-elect the president. That's, that's what the committee basically is. That's its function. Um, these are all people who are connected to FBI, CIA, have this intelligence background. The plumbers are so-called because it's their job to plug leaks. And so what they decide to do in plugging the leaks is rather than just work out where the leaks are coming from and stop them, they go beyond. They start trying to discredit people involved in the leaks. They start trying to discredit reputable witnesses, people who are giving the testimony. Uh, The main example is they go into Daniel Ellsberg, who's the, the analyst who leaked the papers. They break into the psychiatrist's office, um, of Daniel Ellsberg, psychiatrist, and try to steal the files to completely discredit Ellsberg and and make it make his testimony absolutely pointless. So this is where Nixon is already at this point. He's crossing lines. You know, the idea of breaking into a psychiatrist's office to to get access to somebody's per- personal files to discredit them shows that you are prepared to do whatever you need to do to keep and sustain power. And I find that really interesting this early on that we've already got there. And this is why I say the plumbers and the Pentagon Papers are really where this issue of Watergate begins, not so much the break-in at the Watergate. So, And the individuals involved in, in the break-ins and the individuals used in, involved in all of this become more prominent as you get through. Just on a sidebar, we had a bit of a discussion about this before, but I found it fascinating. When you do more digging in in Watergate, what I find fascinating is the number of people directly connected to the White House who were involved in activities. It's not... I mean, I was going to say it's not surprising, um, given that we now know how everything unfolded in that it was a close-knit crew of people. But I think, essentially, at the time, had you lived through it, it would have been shocking that people whose name appeared on the visitor's log, who were seen in photos with the president, who were named people with named titles. These people were doing criminal activities. That just goes to show sort of the brazen disregard for the rule of law that exists in this mentality. One of the key players early on is is, is the former Attorney General, John Mitchell. You know, Mitchell's Mitchell's one of those people who's, you know, he's been... He's but one of Nixon's um, law, law partners at one point. Um, he then oversees. He's originally the Attorney General. Then he oversees the Justice Department's handling of, of desegregation. Then in January of seventy two, Mitchell's out because he's going to head the committee to re-elect the president. So this is John Mitchell, first term Attorney General, who is now directly becoming involved in illegal activities to break into and spy on. Anyone and originally it's just the plumbers. Then they go into what they call what they call the gemstones. So what they decide to do is they're going to they code name all of their operations gemstones. And as somebody we're about to meet, G. Gordon Liddy, mm. talks about, we ran out of gemstones very quickly, and we had to just call them different things <laughs> because we didn't actually have enough rare gemstones for the number of things we were doing. So it's gone from being a, let's stop the leaks. To now it's a Nixon enemies group. 
And the word paranoia is going to come up a hell of a lot in the next part of this discussion. And I think it's one of the hallmarks. If you ask somebody nowadays uh, what they think of when they think of Richard Nixon, corrupt comes up. A crook, because that's his own damn words, (laughs) um, tends to come up. And the other word that comes out of it all the time is paranoia. And I think that Nixon goes down as... I mean, there's a, there's a, f- a, a very famous Saturday Night Live sketch where Dan Aykroyd is portraying uh, Richard Nixon stumbling in the middle of the night around the White House, looking at posters and, and the paintings of all the former presidents, yelling at them about the ideas of all the problems that they they never had this problem and you never had this problem. And he looks at the portrait of Kennedy and he yells, you, sex, in the White House. That never happened in Dick Nixon's day. <laughs> never. And it's, it's all this stuff about, but you all did something wrong. Why am I the one to blame? But it's this very famous caricature. It's like Gerald Ford falling down. <laughs> you know, Nixon's paranoia becomes legendary. What's uh, interesting is that if you're paranoid to an extent, you usually don't do things that will <laughs> lead to you getting in trouble. Like, if you're so paranoid, you usually try and become a law-abiding, straight-laced person. Yeah. And you, the paranoia tra- almost keeps you on the straight and narrow. So what it suggests is that the the paranoia is a symptom for s- some some sort of either hubris or some sort of notion that power for power's sake is good, and that there is no moral compass. It's just guiding his his ambition is the only thing guiding him forward. And consequently, when we see him you know, steer the plumbers uh, into the Watergate Hotel and to bre- to really breaking into um, you know, commit all sorts of crimes against the Democratic Party. Um, what you find is that it's that that pursuit of power, motivated by that pursuit of power, is the only thing that's guiding him. And alongside that, you've got um, you know, e. e. Howard Hunt. E. Howard Hunt is another senior figure within this group. Now, now he was a member of the Plumbers who had been responsible for what they referred to as the neutralisation of Ellsberg. Um, in in regard to the papers. Now, he's then responsible with G. Gordon Liddy of organising the break-in at the Watergate. Now, the interesting part with, with Hunt is that it is a link to one of the burglars that actually starts to unravel all of this. And one of the burglars, when he is discovered, has Hunt's name in his book in a diary with the initials WH next to it. And when I think it was Bob I think it was Bob Woodward found out about these notes, he makes a phone call to Hunt and says to him, Why did one of the burglars at the Watergate have your name and WH written in his diary? To which he's supposed to have said, Oh my god, hung up the phone and tried to vanish. Um now, I don't know about you, but that screams potential leak. You know, if, if I say to you, you know, why did I find your name in a diary linking to somebody breaking into a house, and your response isn't, I don't know, but it's, oh, my God, hang up the phone and run away, <laughs> I'm sensing you're probably connected. It doesn't seem like the most sane or rational link, but it was, and this is exactly what, what took place. Um, so you've got... And we'll come back to his role a bit more because his role becomes far more important when we get to another one of the main players, which is John D. But we'll, we, let's get to my favourite man in this whole thing. Let's get to G. Gordon Liddy. G. Gordon Liddy, for me, one of the craziest people ever connected to a president. Um, and and I say this in full understanding of what is currently <laughs> take place pl- taking place in America. G. Gordon Liddy is a qualified lawyer. But believe it or not, he's a qualified lawyer. Um, he's also a madman. Um, like, he's a legitimate madman. This is, this is a gentleman who, when the first information about the break-in at the Watergate starts getting out, a journalist called John Anderson is doing some digging, um, they're all in a meeting, all the people involved in the plumbers are, are having a discussion and they're all having this, this conversation about what are we going to do about, about the break-ins and what are we going to do about the information that, that all turned up. And there's a discussion that takes place where they say, we're going to kill, you know, we're going to kill An- Jack Anderson. We're going to kill Jack Anderson. And it was Hunt and, and Liddy talking about this. We're going to kill him. It was drug him, then kill him. 
And Liddy walks out of the meeting and a couple of aides report that they see him walking down the corridor going, I'm going to kill Anderson. I'm going to kill Jack Anderson. I'm going to kill I'm going to kill Jack Anderson. And they go in to hunt and they're going, um, what did you just tell Gordon to do? Because I oh, know we were joking around. He goes, no, no. Gordon's going to kill him. So they drag him back into the room and they go, look, Gordon, we're, we're joking. We'll be just... Don't kill him. We're joking around here. And Liddy apparently dead straight looks at them and says, do not ask me to do something if you don't want me to do it. Now, I don't know about you, but the idea that the That's White House insane. has a man on staff who, if you say, go kill someone, his first reaction isn't, probably shouldn't do that, is, sure. Yeah, I'll just go do that, no question. And, and all these is a trained lawyer, I put in inverted commas there. Yeah, Liddy, Liddy is... Yeah, Liddy's, Liddy's a bit insane. And he was... He was he, Funny enough, later on became a right wing um, radio Watch host, up. and especially with the Clintons in the nineteen in the nineteen nineties, said that he believed that, and he, he still is one of the one of the only people connected to Watergate today who still insists he did the right thing, and still insists that the Democrats were such a problem that they needed to do this, and he believed one hundred percent that everything he did was right, and his only regret was they got caught. Crazy wing of the Republican Party alive and well. Yeah, well, we know they're all alive and well. So the burglary. Let's let's we'll talk about the burglary and then we'll go through more of these individuals. So the burglary, which seems to be when you first look at Watergate, what this is about. Now, it's not really about a burglary though. So you've got five men um, who break into the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel and Office Complex. Um, this is on June 17th, 1972. Now, there are five men inside. You have Liddy on the outside, um, and you have you have Liddy on the outside, and you also have Hunt on the outside, both of whom have earpieces and are sort of listening in, and they're radioing in and out. They're up on the floor where... The Democrats have all their papers. Um, there is also a man on watch in the building opposite. A guard at the, the Watergate Hotel comes past, notices that the door lock's taped up. Goes, oh, the cleaners must have done that when they've, they're here and they've forgotten to fix it up. So he untapes the door latch. The burglars discover that the latch has been un- removed and re-tape the door latch. Now, this was their mistake, because when the guard comes back later on, he goes, that's not the cleaners. Something's up. He rings the police. Now, the police officers who respond to the matter are not uniformed patrol squad. They are undercover detectives who look very much like hippies. They've got long hair, they've got beards, they've been infiltrating a whole pile of other activities. They do not look like cops. They are not in a cop car. There are no sirens. There are no lights. They come up to the door. They show their badge to the the guard who then tells them where they're going and they go up. The guy on watch in the other building is watching TV. He's watching a really bad sort of horror movie, space horror movie, actually. (laughs) And he is so engrossed with the television, he doesn't see two gentlemen entering the building. There's no sirens, there's no cop cars, there's no squad cars, there's nothing. So he doesn't think anything of it, keeps watching his TV. Then he goes up, he still hasn't noticed anything. The guys inside are noticing that there's movement going on. Somebody radios back and goes, do any of our guys look like hippies? At which point Liddy goes, no. And they go, in that case someone's on to us. Now, they're trying to radio into the, the team, and there's a whole pile of Hispanics involved, and in the, they can't get through to the actual team on the floor. So they're trying to get radio communications through. They've all turned the game down. They're not listening to their radios. They start discovering officers of the DNC that look like they've been ransacked. Turns out later on, by the way, they hadn't been ransacked. That's just how the Democrats kept their offices. They were an absolute mess. So they're like, well, this one's been destroyed. And the Democrats, no, that's how oh, that's they left Smitty's it. that's Smitty's desk. So that's Smitty's desk. Yeah, Smitty's been there all the time. So they walk through the offices and they're banging on the glass trying to find anybody in there. And he bangs on the glass at one point and one of the burglars puts his head up at the window. And then the cop said, I got such a fright, I jumped backwards, pulled my gun and went, come out with your hands up or I'll shoot. At which point, five sets of hands come up and everyone walks out into the corridor and Liddy said all he heard over the radio in a muffled tone was, they've got us. <laughs> now, 
initially, you go, okay, this is a really bad robbery. <laughs> it's a horrendous break-in. Um, but they're all caught. Why are they breaking into the Democrats? So, logically, you go, political motivations? Possibly. Now, at this point, it just seems to me like it's political espionage at this point in time, which is not, by the way, an offence that you would consider that would bring down Nixon. Uh, any smart president would have had at least three or four buffers between the people doing this mm. and himself, so that, yes, he may well benefit, yes, he may well give the order, but surely through so many channels that he's not going to be um, implicated and brought down with what is essentially just a, a burglary? A burglary? Yeah, a burglary. It's a, it's a break-in. It's a, and, and it's referred to by Nixon's own press secretary as a third-rate burglary. Um, that would come back to haunt him a bit later on. Because, um, you know... The boss ordered it. Anyway, so you've got this break-in situation now at the Watergate Hotel, and it's not a big story. I mean, there's a great bit of footage. If you go onto YouTube and look up the footage of Sam Donaldson reporting on TV, and Donaldson opens up with, you know, the Democratic Party is dealing with a burglary keeper. And it's just this really light-hearted presentation of the fact that five gentlemen were found inside the, the Watergate Hotel, Hotel and Conference Centre. I don't think it was too far out of the realm of um, possibilities that this was almost like a quasi-common thing with political campaigns. That, well, well, yes, Nick... burglary is, is a crime, but breaking in and, and stealing documents and doing some spying, you know, before the days of hacking and, and, yeah. and online tampering, that is how you found things well, out. Well, Nixon's comment about the, about the matter early on was the reason I, I didn't really get worked up about it was it, it seemed very hard for me to, to become outraged at the idea of political espionage. And that's, that's, that's just it's shoes. just both sides just sort of... You know, so, again, at this point in time, it's not a hanging offence. I mean, he probably would have got a bit of a bounce back, but he's not running. Remember, he's in the middle of running for re-election at this point in time, yeah. but he's up against a very unpopular Democratic Party at this point in time. Yeah. He's up against George McGovern. Now, McGovern tries his best to hit him on Watergate, but it's not breaking through. Mm. To give you an idea of how much this isn't breaking through, there's no senior journalist put on this by the Washington Post. Instead, they go to two young journalists, Woodward, uh, Bob Woodward, Carl Bernstein. And they go to Woodward and Bernstein just on the local beat, because it's on the local beat, and go, right, you two, that's yours. Go cover Watergate for us. You do whatever you need to do on that. That's all you need. So it's not given to a senior journalist. It's not given to someone at the main news desk. It's given to these two young guys. And just go and report on this burglary and find out what took place. Now, where it starts to get interesting is that a GOP security aide is one of the burglars. A little bit of a problem there. So John Mitchell comes out and goes, no, 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 not us. Not us. Wasn't wasn't us. Had nothing to do with us. Own. And so like, even then, it's it's a link, but it's a tenuous link. Then, at this point in time, is where things start to change. And it starts to change because Woodward, Woodward and Bernstein get a tip. And they get a tip from a man who would become known as Deep Throat, uh, referencing the pornographic film of the era um, and parroting the idea of deep knowledge, which and deep intel, which is a, a, a term within the FBI. Um, mm. So what we end up with is this idea of... of Deep Throat is giving them information. If you've seen all the President's Men, they show you how he, he told them it was the pot, pot plant, plan. pot plant out on the balcony, and he'd circle a, 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 the column in the paper and where they'd meet, the time he'd written the margin, and they'd have to take three or four cabs to a parking garage, always a parking garage, meet in darkness. He'd never reveal who he was. He was this very secret identity. And there's a couple of interesting things here. First of all, I think Ben Bradley deserves a hell of a lot of credit for not making them cough over the source as mm. the, the editor. And then the owner of the, of the Times, who they do threaten to bankrupt at one point, she goes, no, we're not not giving up the source. This is too good a source to actually hand over. So Deep Throat, which is this, this person who we will come to in a moment, gives them their first tip. And it's a very famous quote now. It's, it's a very famous quote, which is they go, what do you need to know? And the simple quote is, follow the money. It then comes out through Woodward and Bernstein's investigation that $25,000 cashier check earmarked for the Nixon campaign 
ends up in one of the burglar's accounts. It is the first solid link that you have of money going from anything connected to Nixon to a burglar. Now, the interesting thing here is that at this point in time, um, Bob Woodward says later on, if Nixon at this point goes, yeah, we knew about it and apologises, it probably blows over. Yeah, it's, it's not an impeachable offence yet. You know, at this point in time, it's a, you probably shouldn't have done that. That's politically dumb. But it's also not going to turn the margin that Nixon ends up getting in this election that comes up. Certainly could be uh, censured for the action. or He'd lose a lot of popularity, political clout, political capital, mm. but he's not committing himself a, a crime. There's no clear link between Nixon and the crime. No, not, not at this point in time. And even then, you get there's more reporting from the Post, because the Post is the, one that, is the one that's dealing with this mostly. And the Post comes back with... Um, the fact that Mitchell, while he was Attorney General, there was a Republican slush fund to gather intelligence against the Dems. Again, that's just... It's politics. Yeah, you know, it's just there's, Everyone has these sort of units that go out there and try to dig up dirt. Well, for how long was the FBI J. Edgar Hoover's tool for finding out well, if there's well, anything about anyone? Well, all, all the all the information you'll ever see. At some, one day we will do one just on Hoover because he's fascinating. Mm. He's basically the man who ran America for the longest period of time. Yeah. Even under the first years of Nixon. As exactly. Well. And But Hoover had so much information on everybody that there were lots of stories of him ringing presidents and just going... Yeah, no, you're not going to do that. And when the president would say, well, well, I've got this, 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 and this, and again, the Kennedys being the legendary example mm. of Hoover apparently threatening them, and that's a large reason why Kennedy wanted to break up, you know, the organisations. Yeah, yeah. He wanted to break the FBI up to get Hoover out of the out of the picture. Um, but at this point in time, it's still not that bad. And it sounds weird to say it's still not that bad, but it's still not that bad. Then. The FBI actually comes back and links it back to the re-election effort on the 10th of October. How much of an impact does this have? On November 7th, Nixon wins the largest landslide in American political history. Yeah, and there's a solid month that people have to digest this. And Nothing it's happens! And testament to the fact that this is par for the course in politics and it's still not strong enough to bring down a president. The interesting, other very interesting thing to think about, and we, we can't think of it more from our context, but... We live in a 24-hour news cycle where news gets digested and thrown out instantly. Mm. Like, it's so much that keeping up with what happened, you don't really do it. These are days where you do digest the news. Yeah, you you know, sit and ruminate on it. You know, for example, in America, there was always, it was often said that if Walter Cronkite told you, it's true. You know, you believe what Walter says. Mm -hmm. And if Cronkite tells you, and if the other newsmen on those... There are only three networks in America at this point in time. So there's three major networks, and the papers carry a lot of weight too. And if the papers, like the Washington Post, are telling you this is happening, and the news media is telling you, you this is happening, it's factored in. So it wasn't a case of, oh, I was just thrown out of the news cycle. Mm. It was ignored completely. Everyone just went, no, nah. Nixon... So Nixon wins, and wins big. So McGovern is really a non-factor, and he tries to link it back to Watergate, but it just comes across to people like sour grapes. The, the Democrats are just sour that they, they broke in and got all that. So this leads us into now the Nixon second term. It gets off to a really bad start and just goes badly from there. So Liddy and McCord... Um, are convicted of conspiracy, burglary, and wiretapping. That's interesting. Mm. And then five other men pleaded guilty. So the five men plead guilty, but Liddy is found guilty with McCord. They both try to, d d to deny any any particular links to the case. They say, no, it's not us. We didn't do it. Um, then we get... Possibly one of the first moves that, that, that breaks this case wide open. We get to a situation where there is an argument about how far this goes. And the judge involved in the case, John Shiraka. Now, Shiraka, and I always pronounce this incorrectly, so I've probably got it horribly wrong, but who cares? doesn't believe that 
this happened alone. He doesn't believe that these five guys did this breaking all on their own. What is happening, by the way, is that that money from the committee to re-elect the president is now a slush fund to pay for silence. Basically, they're like, just take the fall. It's not going to be that long. We'll put you. We'll lock you up. When you can do a, you can do a short stint. The president can possibly even eventually commute you or whatever, and we'll, we'll get you out of there. Don't worry about it, guys. But we really appreciate you doing us this solid and taking the fall. The problem is that the judge doesn't believe it's a solo effort. So what the judge does is says to them, I've got the power to sentence you to 40 years <laughs> each. I don't believe you acted alone, and unless somebody tells me what happened, you're all going for 40 years. Now, at this point, that little bit of hush money they're getting paid, <laughs> it's not enough. So it's a question now of not if, Somebody is going to roll over? The question is now, when is someone going to roll over? And the answer comes pretty quickly. You get a, n- a, number, of, a number of them sort of ponder it, a number of them think about it, a number of them weigh up the options, but eventually you do indeed get one of the burglars puts his hand up and goes... This this is a lot deeper than you think it is. It's not just us. We're the tip of the iceberg. You need to dig a little bit more. And that's what he says. So they start getting closer and closer and closer to the core here, which is Nixon. Then you end up with Haldeman and Ehrlichman, who are the two young go-getters of the Nixon regime. They're the two young advisors. These are the guys who have sort of been pulling the strings on on everything Nixon wants done. They're his, they're his go-to men. And Ehrlichman and Haldeman and the Attorney General Kleindice resign. And the reason they take the fall is because they figure if we take the fall, Nixon's safe. And like, as long as Nixon's safe, yeah. everyone's safe. And there's a very there's a very in-depth phone call and there's a, there's a long account given um, in a couple of like recent retellings because the interesting part is that they've all talked. Yeah. Everyone involved has talked about it. And I think it was Haldeman... Um, who said that there's a phone call where Nixon's on the phone, so you know he he says that they've, they've resigned, and then he rings them up and goes, "I hope I did you boys justice. I hope you, I did you great, great credit." Tells them both that he loves them and he's really proud of what they've done for him, and thank you very much for this. And and we know this because of something that's about to be mentioned. <laughs> Nixon taped everything, so <laughs> no. so to race through this a little bit more because I want to get to the analysis. They announce also at this point in time there is a White House the White House counsel, a guy called John Dean, is fired. Now Dean starts questioning Nixon in the lead up to his firing. And a large reason that Dean gives in later interviews is that Dean knew that he was being set up as the fall guy. And if you listen to the tapes, he was being set up as the fall guy. The idea was that John Dean was the White House counsel. He knew that he was committing perjury by lying. And therefore, we'll just throw Dean under the bus when the time comes. John Dean works this out, starts challenging a little bit more. Nixon gets rid of him um, because Nixon just can't can't have him there. That's a bad decision. It's always a bad decision when you're you're setting someone else up for failure. I think that's what is the 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 fall of all of this that. There is clear guilt to assign and people just keep trying to shunt it off to someone else and that's going to lead to someone breaking silence. That's always going to lead to someone going, nope, I'm not taking this and breaking. And it's this continuous pressure from above on different people from different sources that leads to all this breaking open. Now, the moment that would eventually doom Nixon happens. They appoint a special prosecutor. So at this point in time, Nixon's officially saying very publicly, very loudly... I will cooperate 100%. We will talk to the special... If they want to talk to us again, we will make everyone available. We are more than happy to do this. So you get Archibald Cox, who's the former Solicitor General, is appointed as the Special Prosecutor for Watergate. Um, And there is going to be the Senate Watergate Committee hearings. And they're televised. And that, as one person... as I think uh, think it was Sam Donaldson referred to it, it became America's favourite soap opera. (laughs) Because it was this weird cast of characters that was being brought in every day and there was someone different every day. And the amount of stuff that comes out of, of, of these hearings, just in terms of the personalities... And I want to start with Sam Irvin. <laughs> Sam Irvin. I'm I'm just a country lawyer. 
I'm just a country lawyer, and I don't really know what's what, but I'm going to... And it was this homespun way that Irvin just sort of cuts through the treacle of the, well, what is right and what is wrong? Irvin harks back to a day where you, your answer was like, no, no, this is right, this is wrong. Never the twain shall meet. And I'm not, I'm not into this in terms of finding out about, you know, what's moral versus right. It's either right or it's wrong. And Irvin, as basically the chairman of the committee, plays a pivotal role in cutting through the crap. Because if you'd had, you know, a, a more moderate sort of Republican or, or if you'd had a, say, for example, you'd ended up with a Nixon Republican chairing yeah, that you... committee, it would have been railroaded. Yeah, if you have a, a partisan chair mm. of this, um, either you're going to get a cover-up or it's going to look like you're witch-hunting. Here they've appointed a distinguished middle-of-the-road, works with the left, works with the right, had investigated McCarthy, had clearly demonstrated a, a legal nous, which isn't um, bogged down in nuance but just can cut through and can see right for right and wrong for wrong and speaks like the common man and woman of society that there is a law and it's either broken or it's not it's not broken by degrees there's right and wrong and this is a person Irvin who really stands up for those ideas Irvin, Irvin also gives me my favourite quote of the entire Watergate scandal and it comes when Nixon refuses to appear So Nixon refuses to appear, claiming basically that he has um, executive privilege. This is the quote from Irvin. Divine right of kings went out with the American Revolution and doesn't belong to White House aides. I don't think we have any such thing as royalty or nobility that exempts them. That is not executive privilege. That is executive poppycock. And he then followed up by talking about Nixon and he quotes Twain. He says, the truth is very precious. Use it sparingly. And he says that Nixon used it sparingly. <laughs> I love that about Sam Irvin. He is the hero for me of the whole Watergate proceeding, Politician. even more so than a John Dean. They just don't even talk like that anymore, politicians. Where's the where's the soaring or the cutting rhetoric of today? There's just no, none. it's bland. It's, it's all bland. It's just filtered and poll tested. Yeah. And so they appoint all this, everything begins, and they call John Dean. Now... John Dean has said White House counsel, the man who knows what perjury is, the man who knows all of the laws that Nixon has been breaking um, and was being set up to take the fall for all of the laws that Nixon was breaking. Now, Dean got his wife to write up his notes. What he didn't realise was he was then going to be expected to read them. I think it was about 45,000 words. <laughs> so John Dean's statement, he thought he'd just give his statement over and then that would be the question. No, 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 no. In that statement, John Dean tips a bucket all over Richard Nixon. He basically sends and sits there and goes that he spoke with Nixon 35 times about the Watergate cover-up. More than once, I think. So, yeah. He, see, he outlines 35 specific incidents where he spoke to Nixon about the cover-up. And Liddy talks famously about the idea that... that Liddy had said privately we need to watch out for Dean because if Dean feels like the ship's going down he's going to be the one to stab us all because Dean knows what's going on and Dean really has no loyalty. The the thing to remember is that the people who took the fall for Nixon were all Nixon loyalists and he he wanted a lot of personal loyalty Um, and he got a lot of personal loyalty. Remember as we said this was a young administration most of whom would never have seen office under a president. So they really owed Nixon, and Nixon knew that, and I think that was a large reason for getting such a young team around him. I think there's a definite lesson to be learned to not surround yourself with yes-men, that you need the objective voices, you need people who aren't buying into your brand, who aren't drinking your Kool-Aid, to actually keep the, the ship sailing in the right direction. You need people to say stand up and say no. No, the, the, Dor- the Doris Kearns Goodwin team of rivals. You need well. That's that. I think if you look at all the greatest presidents, they are the people who surround themselves with people who could be objective. If you've got Lincoln, you've got the team of rivals. You've got Washington. You've got Jefferson and Adams and Hamilton, all arguing yep. over different opinions. You look at FDR. It was a circulation of people who vehemently disagreed with the new idea, but were sorry, the new deal, but would work towards doing it in some degree or another. And and I mean, you could even go. And 
someone it's, it, he often gets mistaken for a yes man, but you can even go with someone like a Bobby Kennedy yep. with with JFK. So who yes, it was his brother, but the reason why he trusted Bobby's advice was he knew that Bobby wasn't bullshitting for political reasons. There was truth in the words. Bobby had a reason for doing it. And he knew that he knew that Bobby wasn't going to steer him wrong because he wanted to be politically advantaged by it. He was going to give him his honest opinion, mm. and especially during Cuban Missile Crisis, it's it's Bobby Kennedy who sort of helps get JFK through that crisis and and, and gives him the advice that his chiefs of staff don't, basically. So Dean has blown the, the lid off the top and said, "Yep, Nixon knows about it." Now, at this stage, it's, okay, well, that's John Dean's word. He's a sacked member of the sacked. administration. There's all this evidence against him. The, the, the Post then also reports that they've found um, a memo in Ehrlichman, to Ehrlichman talking about the Pentagon Papers, so they're, they're linking Ehrlichman. But again, Ehrlichman's been sacked. So you can go, well, he acted alone. There's no proof that Nixon is involved. Until July 13th. Alexander Butterfeld, the appointment secretary for Nixon, is called. He announces that in 1971, Nixon has the system for recording that was put in by his predecessor, LBJ, removed, and installs a new voice recording system into the White House. A better recording system with hookers and booze. (laughs) Not quite. It's a sound recording system which is voice activated. The second you start talking in the Oval Office, it records. There are microphones in the bases of the lamps and the desk has been drilled into eight times and there are microphones all over the White House desk. Every time you walk into that room and you say something, the microphone triggers and records you. Suddenly... There's a way to get access to did this happen or not. And there's a lot of strange conversations with checkers as well. <laughs> yes, lots of strange conversations with that dog. He loved that dog, even though that dog by that point was long gone. <laughs> um, so, and actually, you, you, you say that in jest. However, that's one of the reasons why we also know that Nixon was a bit crazy because it does record a lot of his conversations in the Oval Office that he sort of had with himself towards the end of the run. And... He, he is slowly going mental. If you've ever sat down, I have actually sat down and listened to a majority of the Nixon tapes. First of all, um, if you need to sleep, it's a great way to go to sleep. <laughs> it's a beautiful way to go to sleep because it's long and it's boring as all hell and you're holding out. For one nugget. You're holding out for the nugget of information um, and you're holding out for, for this one moment in, in, in the tapes. And when they eventually do give the tapes over, they give over, I think it's 63 tapes um, given over. It's it's amazing. Um, so on July 13, they announced there's a taping system. By the 18th of July, that's gone. No, no, what Nixon's tried system? to get it removed. Um, they then turn around. The Senate goes, can we have the tapes? Nixon goes, no, no. Executive privilege means I don't have to give you the tapes. Then October 20 takes place, and October 20 is the moment that Nixon seals his fate. On October 20th, it is referred to famously as the Saturday Night Massacre. He fire, he tries to fire the special prosecutor, Archibald Cox. He goes to the Attorney General, and he goes, you need to fire the prosecutor. And the Attorney General goes, mm, I'm not going to fire the prosecutor. That's, that's wrong. That's wrong, and that's kind of in breach of... A lot of, you know, can't do that. Mm. So he fires the Attorney General. I, th- I think that most people believe that this is where obstruction of justice kicks in. This is where he, he gets, this is it. He then goes to the Deputy Attorney General. And I love this, he was he was interviewed, uh, William Rookshaus was interviewed about this. And he said, I was Attorney General for about half an hour, which I found out is not long enough to get your name on the wall. <laughs> uh, he makes him the Attorney General and then goes, fire the special prosecutor. And he goes... No, so he gets rid of him. Then he gets the third person who's the Solicitor General, and he calls the Solicitor General and he goes, congratulations, you're now the Attorney General, sack the prosecutor. And the, and he does agree to sack Archibald Cox. Now that's Robert Bork. Oh, Bork, Bork, Become Bork. 
even more famous when he's nominated for a Supreme Court appointment <laughs> after displaying clear, not just nep- uh, and partisanship, but also just a flagrant abuse of the law. He then is nominated for a position on the Supreme Court. Yeah, I know. It's, 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 it's insane. I mean, look, you can go, I was, an, I was an Attorney General. I was a Solicitor General and an Attorney General. I'm so qualified for this role. <laughs> no one has been more qualified than me. I've held both roles in the administration. The second most important man to ever say you're fired in oh, the White House. We'll come back to that in a minute. Who's who's the first one? Um, Andrew Jackson. That's what I thought. Yeah. So now at this point, you've got impeachment proceedings. Yeah, it's started. Right by this, well, the second he sacks a special prosecutor. And this is one of the reasons why we're going to we're talking about the importance of Watergate. <clears throat> the idea of sacking a special prosecutor that's investigating the president usually leads to impeachment. Yeah, the the attorney general, despite what may be constructed in the media or on Twitter at the moment, the attorney general doesn't work for the president. The attorney general essentially works for the law or the people. He is it is the per, the people's highest representative of the law. They're not. At the beck and call. They're not the lawyer off the president. They don't work for the president. They work for the law. And in a sense, they could be seen as another check and balance on the application of the president to -to day-to-day actions. I mean, remember, it was the Attorney General who had to appoint... Mm. Who had to appoint the the special prosecutor in the first place? So the attorney general is the person who is supposed to be looking out for the interests of the law being maintained, and that's one of the reasons why when he says sack him, he goes, no, I appointed him to do the job because we need someone independent to do the job. He's an independent, qualified yeah. lawman. We're not going to sack our. There's no Cox. reason no. to fire. Him. Give me the reason why, and he goes, well, no. Um, it's probably also worth noting that in the same month uh, of October 1973, Spiro Agnew, who is the vice president to Richard Nixon, <laughs> has been indicted on tax fraud, uh, income invasions, uh, a whole plethora of political corruptions, and has had to quit the vice presidency. And so consequently, you've got on one hand the president's being investigated for crimes, and so too is the vice president. So there's this, there's so much mud being thrown around... Now, and- so remember also sticking. less than a year or just uh, just under a year since they've won the yeah, largest yeah. landslide in American political history the vice president's gone yep. the president is in absolute trouble he is in dire straits and and trying to work out how he stays in power at this point and his only saving grace is the idea the Republican party is going to save him and it's up to the Republicans to just go we've got the numbers no we can't except they don't have the house yeah. And they don't have it. In fact, the Democrats, even though they lose that election, they get the House. Yeah. And they get the Senate. So the Dems have the numbers. So it, it, it's a really interesting time. As soon as it Spiro gets... Agnew's got to go, has yeah. got to go. And there's a mad scramble to quickly find a vice president. Um, and they pick the mo. I, I mean, there's no there's no record to support what I'm saying except for well, general let's just, inference. Let's just say, what, what, was, what was his only qualification? What was his one claim to fame before he was vice president? Oh, I, I, I blank out on that. What is it? He was on the Warren Commission. Right, investigating the assassination of JFK. Which went so well. Yeah. Um, for me, the only reason they picked Gerald Ford is because he knew how to spell his own name because... Um, the exoneration off the crimes would be forthcoming for whoever they would put into the vice presidency should Nixon step down. Yep. So the idea was they wanted to put someone in there who they knew would do what the, what they needed them to do and wasn't going to be his own man. And, and Ford was never his own man. Um, we mentioned this on the President's episode we did. Yeah. Again, go back into the archives for that one. <laughs> so we then come to a date which will live in infamy, <laughs> December 7th. Although, unfortunately, it's not 1941. It's December 7th, 1973. This is the date that it is announced that Secretary Rosemary Woods had been reviewing the tapes on on September 29 and was listening to this tape from June 20th, 72, and accidentally, while transcribing it, answered a phone call and accidentally hit the button next to it. Not the stop button, but the record button. And we got 18 and a half minutes of silence over the middle of this really important tape. And there's a great photo. I recommend strongly you look it up. 
of her showing how she was answering the phone and holding the button down. It became famously known as, as, as the Rosemary Stretch. Because <laughs> she's one arm, one end of the desk, one arm, the other end, leaning back on her chair. It is the most implausible thing possible. Well, you say that, but you would have thought a president being impeached for breaking in or for uh, fraudulently overseeing slush funds and, and uh, you know, the plumbers and whatnot, you would have thought that, that would have been impossible as well. She had to push her foot pedal down as well. Okay, I, I, I withdraw that comment. Right. She also, by the way, said she wasn't responsible for all of it. She said she was responsible for five minutes of it and couldn't explain the other 13 and a half minutes. I like how uh, Chief of Staff Alexander Hay says one theory was that some sin- sinister force could have been the thing that uh, got the... And who knows what the conversation would have been? I can't imagine it would have been it would have been anything important because Nixon and Haldeman were the ones talking on the tape, and in the notes that Haldeman had from that day, they had been discussing the arrests at the Watergate Hotel at that period of sure. time. That tape is missing the conversation about the arrests at the Watergate. So I can't imagine there was anything unusual on that tape. Can you? No, it was probably nothing. Talking about the weather. Yeah, talking about the weather, talking about um, Vietnam, bit of of, of, of corruption. Redecorating the office. Bit of corruption. Bit of, a little, minor. Minor corruption. Minor, Spiro, Spiro. Spiro, what's he up to now that he's... What's his tax lien? (laughs) What's the tax lien? (laughs) So, at this point in time, we've got still nothing happening. Now, we're into 1974. He's still president. You know, he's one office in 72. We've gone through the entirety of 73 with it becoming more and more apparent by the day that the president has potentially been involved in some corrupt dealings, is definitely refusing to hand over any evidence that could prove otherwise, and is just sacking people who might be in his way. And he's still president. I think because this is so unprecedented... It's it's tolerated in in some sort of weird sense that there's no riots in the street, there's no um, overt push by your average Joe who's going to work for Nixon to resign. Yeah, in the political sphere, there's the growing calls that he resign. In the newspapers, it's getting more and more demanding. But there's no sort of riotous action on the street because this has never happened before. There's never been some sort of cloud hanging over administration day after day for full years which have the potential to ruin the said administration. Now we get we get to the point now where they're still asking for the tapes. It's still on appeal, by the way. The tapes have been asked for. Nixon is going executive privilege means I don't have to hand the tapes over. There's no way, no reason I need to do it. So the Senate committee by August is already taking legal action. He's still refusing point blank to do it. He's not going to to make any any assisted claims on this. He's not going to hand it over. Nixon is very firm. Then they decide by February the House votes to start investigating grounds for impeachment. Now that's serious. Seven members of Nixon's staff are then indicted by the grand jury to appear about Watergate-related crimes, and Nixon is named as an unindicted co-conspirator. So the President of the United States is now referred to as an unindicted co-conspirator for Watergate-related crimes. But again, he's still President. The new special investigator, by the way, then asks for 64 additional tapes. What happens is that Nixon gives transcripts but refuses to hand over any form of tape. He is not going to do it. Um, at this point in time, by the way, there's a there's a poll that's done about should Nixon resign. 49% of people in America said no. Yeah, it's, it's just so unprecedented that I don't think your average American citizen knows how to react mm. to this. Now, he still only gives over 1,200 pages of transcript. Now, the language is a bit unusual because they're not used to hearing you know, leaders talking like people. Human um, beings. There's no swearing. It's just a lot of expletive deleted. But there's a hell of a lot of the words expletive deleted. And then we end up with... They start the impeachment hearings. And this is in the lead-up to the United States versus Richard Nixon. So this case is is ruled on on July 24, 1974. 
And the Supreme Court, the nine-person Supreme Court bench, one member recuses themselves because they've worked previously to to this. They'd worked in, in with John Mitchell in a law firm. So they recuse themselves and go, no, I'm not going to be involved in this hearing. It is an eight-nothing landslide. Nixon loses. Nixon has to hand over the tapes. Now, Nixon... No one wanted to tell him. There's a great story from his advisors at the time. They talked about how are we going to let him know. And the decision was made, let's just write eight nothing on a piece of paper, tie it to the dog collar, and just push the dog in the room. Because no one wanted me to be the person to go to Richard Nixon and tell him that he just lost eight nothing. Um, it's almost unheard of. You know, the other is the other the president just being soundly routed in legal proceedings. So he then releases, but you then get the articles of impeachment, obstructing the Watergate investigation, misuse of power and violating the oath of, oath of office, failure to comply with House subpoenas. Notice how none of that says breaking and entering into the Watergate Hotel or arranging such. Yeah. This again is why Bob Woodward talks about the idea that if he'd apologised, mm. he would have got away with it. But it's because Nixon gets very Nixon-esque and just refuses point blank that, that that's what happens. Now, he starts to release tapes because he has to. And the conversation six days after the Watergate break-in is the one that gets him. June 23rd, 1972. It's referred to as the smoking gun tape. Um, in that is where Nixon says that we need to order the FBI to stop the investigation. Then there are other transcripts later on that talk about paying hush money. The most infamous one of those is the John Dean discussion. What had been happening was that of all the people that had gone down in, in prison and had gone down and been indicted, Howard Hunt had started to ask for hush money. And these people knew that, well, they need to protect themselves. Yeah. So think about it. If you're paying hush money to these sorts of criminals, are they going to take their hush money and walk away? No, they're going to take their hush money and go, no, we want more hush money. So Hunt asks for more hush money and more hush money. And Dean said he wanted to stop the issue once and for all and get Nixon to break the cycle. He tells Nixon about Hunt's latest requests and he says, Nixon goes, how much do you need? Dean off the top of his head goes, a million dollars over the next two years. Nixon pauses and then on tape audibly says, we can get that. Big money in those days. The president has just said, we can get more hush money if we need it. There is no doubt in my mind that these sorts of tapes, again, f- f- the fact that these tapes broke anywhere is, is amazing. Nixon still has the hope of the Republicans holding him out. He rings up a couple of very well-known senators. I believe it's Strom Thurmond's the last one he rings. Mm. And he rings and they say, you can still save it. Um, no, it wasn't, I wasn't um, him, it was... Um, I can't remember. Anyway, he rings one of the, the major Republicans and goes, are you with me? And his response is, no, Mr. President, I am not. Gets off the phone, looks at his aide and goes, I just lost I just lost the White House. The next day, August 8th, Richard Nixon is the first president in the United history of the United States to resign. He's then pardoned by Gerald Ford, um, which is, you know, again, this, our long national nightmare is, is at an end, yeah. um, is the statement over that. And... It's interesting, there's been a lot of revisiting of... First of all, Nixon tried to get history revisited on Nixon. Failed miserably. And as um, Bob Woodward once pointed out, it's because we've got the tapes. Yeah. Um, the second thing with, with the revisiting, though, is that it's been revisited and most people now concede that Ford pardoning Nixon was actually the right call. And it was because it that rather than drag it out for forever and cause unmitigated turmoil in America that was already struggling with what was happening post-Vietnam and eventually where it would go, that what Ford did by doing that was just going, we're done, move past it, get over it, move on. There's a large school of thought that says that the the pardoning of Nixon is more part of the just get this out of the way and we can get back to doing what we do. I think the inadvertent effect of that is to partisan uh, create a much more partisan environment in US politics in that the left was 
was all of a sudden betrayed by common sense as they saw it, and that the the hard left, the middle left, uh, and the actual left Democrats, the the hard and liberal Democrats, were hoping that at some point the right and the you know, the traditional enemy would agree that some greater legal resolution was needed. And when Gerald Ford signed that, the the left that was of that generation of the seventies and eighties forever turned its back on working in a constructive, meaningful way with the right to the point where they started to um, mould into a new form of politics, which you start to see uh, under Jimmy Carter, then under uh, Bill Clinton, the idea that they're a much more centrist left party to really keep um, themselves alive without having to rely on other sides because they felt ultimately betrayed by... Uh, Gerald Ford and his pardoning of Nixon. Yeah, and I think there's some, there's some interesting quotes, and this one's a particularly interesting one given the context and where we're heading now. Ford said, The political lesson of Watergate is this. Never again must America allow an arrogant elite guard of political adolescence to bypass the regular party organisation and dictate the terms of a national election. So Gerald Ford said that? Yes, he did. Not Barack Obama or... No, Gerald okay, Ford. Right. Gerald Ford... Let's move into this. Well, to be fair, um, he he has the best intentions there. He does. So why Watergate, and what is the importance of Watergate? Watergate is that is always referred to by um, historians as that touchstone moment, as we said, where watershed moment. People stop trusting their government. Mm. They just stopped. You know, you no longer go into the idea with good intentions. You don't believe that people go in with good intentions anymore. People used to believe that they went into politics with with good intentions. Everyone now sees that they don't go in with good intentions. They're going in for their own self benefit, and this is something that I think that's the first thing that there is. There is a definite America pre Watergate mm. and post Watergate. Oh, definitely. And the role of the media in American politics becomes so much more important. Um, Important from then, but I think now the media hasn't quite realised it's relatively unimportant in the sense that, given that they've now um, sort of bankrupted themselves morally and it's it's partisan media as much as partisan politics, the the influence the media once had is now once again lost, and and the lessons learned from Watergate about strong independent journalism. Has, has largely been lost in the idea of profit-making and um, sensationalism. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's a really... It's an interesting thing. It's an interesting way to, to look at it as well. I mean, people like Bob Wood would talk about it still all the time, obviously, because it was their was it. big, big moment. Um, but, I mean, I love, I love the way that Woodward once referred to it as, as a, a cast of characters as varied as a Tolstoy novel. <laughs> and if you think about the number of people, like, again, the, how, the, your John Deans to your G. Gordon Liddies going through the same trial, working yeah, for the same administration, the same um, I find that, that really fascinating. Woodward also once said that I believe that Watergate shows the system worked, particularly the judiciary and the Congress and ultimately an independent prosecutor working within the executive branch. And I think it gave America... On one hand, it gave America this, oh, my God, what are our politicians doing? But on the other hand, it gave them this idea that the system works. What we set up does work. And I think it actually put a little bit more faith in the Constitution, surprisingly. I think um, while I would agree with the, the sentiments there that... Uh, the system work. I think it's worth just tweaking the phrasing and saying that system worked mm. because the system has changed since then to where every job, every post, every outlook is a political one. So now the Supreme Court, I doubt you would get a unanimous ruling on what is and isn't executive, mm. executive privilege. We are starting to move into a potential f- uh, phase where the Attorney General is not seen as an independent lawman in the White House and that it's potentially there to protect the President that a special prosecutor is a tool to be used by one side or the other in potential witch hunts, and then that just forces people's hand to be better at cover-ups. And I also think that what comes out of... There are a couple of things that also come out of of, of Watergate with regards to the idea of, of a cover-up, and in particular the idea of leaks. 
Now, remember, the whole thing was put together to stop leaks, <laughs> and we get the most famous leak ever, which is Deep Throat. Now, we need to address Deep Throat, because we haven't mentioned who the hell it was. Nice. Now... There's a great bit in the smoking gun tapes. And I said, I do recommend you go through and look at it. And they're talking about the idea that the FBI would eventually shut the organist, shut the thing down. And they talk about the acting director. And then they talk about the deputy director, Mark Felt, and say that Felt's an ambitious gentleman and, and Felt will want to be in on this. Mark Felt was Deep Throat. The, the deputy director of the FBI was Deep Throat. Now, there are lots of reasons given as to why Felt did this. I mean, his daughter talks often about the idea that he couldn't stand the wrong being done by his country, but the other political pragmatic reason was he was expected to be the next director of the FBI and he's passed over. Hmm. This is why you don't scorn people in those positions unless you're sure of it. Yeah. Because Mark Felt basically turned informant, one, because he saw what was happening, but two, and far more importantly, he was just angry about the fact that he'd been the guy who was doing all the all the work. He'd been the guy who was next in line to, to Hoover, and when Hoover dies, he doesn't get it. Mm. Um, so it's political sort of... It's it's sort of a political move by him. Well, my career's not going anywhere. What's the point? Um, but the fact that nobody really, really saw Watergate as a big scandal... In the first year and a half. Yeah. When you look back on it now, historically, it's baffling. The fact that you can look at that and go, you know what? It's not that big a deal. And Nixon would spend his whole life trying to convince everyone that Watergate wasn't a big deal. Well, in the the Frost-Nixon interviews, he comes out and says, the law is the... I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but the law is the law, but when the president breaks the law, it's not a crime. He's, he's got some sort of ordained power. And, and Frost really has no reply to it when he says that because, in a sense, that's the most revealing moment of Nixon, that he saw himself, or at least the presidency, uh, as something above and beyond your, your normal person. And then contrast that to the uh, deference and the respect that the, the likes of Washington and Lincoln and FDR uh, had shown to that role... There's a clear inconsistency between what is the role of the president. Is it to be the, the moral leader as well as everything else, or is it to be the person who achieves with no end in sight? And I think that Nixon Nixon and Watergate and the scandal and all, all the events of Watergate, if you want to explain the 1970s America in a nutshell, that's it. Yeah. Right, because America, if you look at the decades, if you look at America post-Great Depression, the 1930s are a time of rebounding and, and, and rebuilding and, and the New Deal, and then you go into the war, obviously, but that rebuilding. The 40s are America America's triumphant, you know, emergence as the world power. It's the birth. The 1950s is that big boom that America has where they become the centre of the world and in the universe. stereotypical yep. America, white picket fence. 60s, even though 60s America is tumultuous, it's still America as the leader and the forefront of the world, even though it is a very tumultuous period and there are a lot of issues. Um, domestically, in foreign policy, you know, again, Vietnam is going on and it's bad, but... You know, it's still most of that period is still America is the predominant power. The nineteen seventies for the United States are horrendous. Mm. You know, there is the oil crisis that Jimmy Carter ends up facing. You've mm. got Iran Contra takes you know all the leading to Iran Contra, which would eventually happen in in that run there. The hostages being taken. You've got depression takes place in America. The economy falls apart completely. Gerald Ford. Um, it's all. Nixon and there's an, there's an interesting an interesting way to look at at what happened with regards to why everything takes place the way it does and I think it comes down to and and, and it comes down to Reagan is so successful because Reagan is following Ford and Reagan is following Nixon and Reagan is following Carter also, Robert Dulles, um, the presidential historian, quotes that Kennedy is remembered as a success because of what came after. Johnson and Vietnam, Nixon and Watergate. Yeah, that's something, and it's probably an episode in and of itself, but certainly history has been much better to the likes of Kennedy, um, probably even LBJ. Even though he gets tarred pretty hard, he still gets off quite lightly, I'd say, because there's this 
one thing that overshadows every post-war presidency in America, which is Nixon. Yep. Nixon, you can't escape that that stink or that shadow or that mud as a point of comparison. It's it's always well, he's bad, but at least he's not Nixon. I mean, I remember when George Bush mm. in two thousand and one, two thousand two, two thousand three. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, okay, he's a bad president. Oh, he's corrupt. He's starting wars overseas, but you know, at least he's not Nixon. Now the crux of the crux of everything we're talking about today comes down to the idea of the presidency being an office that is unfettered by controversy as much as it can be, that is run along the lines of the American Constitution, that is governed within the parameters of the Constitution, that is run f- by the people, for the people, mm. you know, the, 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 the way that you would express it. Um, and the people have this ultimate deciding factor. I can't see why we felt the need to talk about Watergate. No, no. Can, can, can you? I don't know. It's, I feel as though it just sort of uh, it struck like a... Like a bolt of lightning out of the blue. It struck like a bolt of lightning or a, or a vodka bottle on the back of the head at a meeting. Um, <laughs> I think Russian vodka, I'd say. I would definitely say Russian vodka. I think that this is something that America's still dealing with, to be honest with you, oh, and definitely. I think that we're seeing it now. And the reason we're discussing it now is obviously with the situation happening in America with Trump and Russia and details coming out day by day. And if you actually go through and look at a timeline of the Watergate events... And now have a look at the timeline of the events in the Trump-Russia investigation. They are mirroring each other. Yeah, what you're seeing with the Trump-Russia is that it's not that... And I'm not an apologist for Trump at all, but it's probably not that Trump himself committed any sort of crime. That probably some sort of minor, maybe treasonous crime, which is not a minor crime, but maybe a minor or major crime was committed by a satellite to him. Kushner could have done some illegal business with Russia while sanctions were on. A a junior Trump could have easily been at a meeting that was not supposed to happen or a discussion had someone, but not necessarily the president. Now, had that president just come out, apologised and sacked anyone who had done something inappropriate, like Nixon, could have gotten through it. But the longer this goes on, the deeper the hole becomes to get out of because one misspoken word all of a sudden can become a crime. And that's what we see with Nixon and it's what we're starting to potentially see with tweets and interviews and newspaper reports. And now. and one thing that Nixon actually said at the, at, at the time and after the fact in interviews is that at the end of the day, the buck stops with the guy at the top. And he, he, even he said, look, I should have done more on this, this, this. Even when he was denying the idea that he had involvement per se with Watergate, he, he said that I should have done more to crack down on it because at the end of the day, the bucks doesn't stop with the minor underling who's done this. The buck stops with the guy at the top. Yeah. And I think that it's, it's going to be an interesting next few months into, into years potentially of where America goes. And I think... If it does head down that path, Watergate's going to be dragged up really, and those scars from Watergate that have sort of healed a little bit for America. There's a great couple of there, there was a couple of quotes after the fact where it was talking about the death of America as a result of Watergate. Chris Allman talked on the weekend, the ABC journalist, mm. when viral in Australia and then in America about the idea of the, the far, pushing fast forward on the demise and decline of America mm. um, after the, the G20 meetings. And I think that it's, it's something to bear in mind going forward that America's done this before. This is not new ground for America. The only uh, caveat <laughs> I would add to that is that um, since, I'd say, probably 9-11 and George Bush... America's president's become the world's president. Yep. George Bush was our president. I mean, we don't live in America. Yep. We have a prime minister in Australia, whatever. But he was our president's much. And then Barack Obama grabbed that and ran with it. He was the world's president. Mm. He could go to any city and get 100,000, 200,000 yep. people to turn out. He became... Uh, the right to use it to, as a detraction. But he became a celebrity president. Now Trump is the world's president, the the nature of the presence has shifted again and it's the world's president. If he fails as a president, America fails as a president and consequently the world will look to someone else to fill that hole or they will start to factionalise and the EU will become a thing, China will become a thing, India is a thing, Russia will be a thing and it will be a, another remaking of international leadership. I think what we've what we one of the other long term effects of Watergate, which we're seeing now, is that when Watergate took place, no other major power was ready to step up. 
also true. And take America's leadership role within the world. If someone else had been in that position, America may well have found itself in a completely different situation come the 1980s than Reagan being able to just step back up and go, right, we're back, we're America again, and yeah, go away, we're going to escalate things. The difference being that there are other powers now in the position to step up, mm. and there are other blocks. I think the, the, the current situation, I actually think the EU situation is almost something that came out of this idea of, well, America could falter again. We need a backup plan. That's certainly the direction Merkel seems to be yeah. taking the EU now. Yeah, and I, I think that that's sort of where things like the EU are going. And I do, I do think that is a response to the idea of, well, last time America had this big slip, no one was ready. Mm. We need to be ready because it might happen again. And if it happens again, someone's going to fill that vacuum. Yeah. And I, I think that America... And I, I think that America is still, as we said before, it's dealing with the scars of Watergate. And they're still, even though they're not on the surface, they're just below the surface. And there are events taking place now. Like you're seeing a lot more of Bob Woodward. You're seeing a lot more of everybody involved, Bernstein. You're seeing everyone coming out. John Dean spoke, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, about the idea that, you know, I was obviously I was around there, and me. I'm watching it and I'm going, this is worse than what happened with Watergate. Yeah. So all these people who were around with Watergate are now coming back out of the woodwork and going, it's happening, we can see it, this is all happening again. And these aren't Democrats. They're Republicans coming out. Like John Dean was, again, a Republican special counsel to the president. You know, he wasn't a Democrat. And I know that by the way the parties are today, people who were Republicans would now definitely be tarred as being left-leaning Democrats. Yep because of the way the American system's lurched. But I think that that's something else. And the other other last issue, before we wrap it up, is the media. Mm. And I think the role of media and a 24-hour news cycle is... I, I can't imagine Watergate in a 24-hour news cycle. Uh, I can't... You know, you just can't imagine how it would have gone if it would have sped it up, if it would have prolonged it, if it would have quashed it. I, I cannot understand... And Alex Jones and yelling been, oh, loudly about the fact that, that John Dean is a lizard... There's a there's an episode somewhere where we talk about Alec Jones's idea that all of this is tied up to the Kennedy assassination. <laughs> it's it's an amazing theory which me as a young teenager with very little worldly experience thought that explains everything, but I look back now and go what drugs is he on and where can I get it? I can give you a bit of a hint. There is going to be sort of a, a couple of Kennedy episodes that will be in our very near future, one relating to assassination and I think another one relating to a, a revisit of, of Kennedy and how he's portrayed by by the press and the media. So that's something coming up in, in the near future. But for now, I think we'll wrap up Watergate for, for, for where we are. Please. Um, as I said, more of a narrative history, this one, just to sort of get you back into the idea of what's going on because I get the feeling... We're going to be revisiting this in the not-too-distant oh, future. Yes. So with that in mind... I've been Thomas. And I've still been Chris. And we'll catch you on the flip side. Bye. Bye.